All right, let's uh, bow our head for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for another Sabbath day. We ask that you'll bring your presence, your Holy Spirit, to enlighten our minds, that we may see more of you and more of your character. Please bless us today in Jesus' name, amen. All right, continuing on with these lecture series, this is now lecture 11. And what we are going to call this is communication. And in any kind of communication, you've got a sender and a receiver. We're not worried about the sender, but we've got to make sure the receiver's all right. So this is going to be somewhat of a medical lecture, health lecture. And we're going to start with some things here. This book was written in 2001, Why God Won't Go Away. And I, the authors are there, Newberg. And I've taken a few quotes out of this book because I think it makes very clear what we need to look at. And it says here, neurology makes it clear. There's no other way for God to get into your head except through the brain's neural pathways. Some of us take that for granted. We think that we understand everything, that this is reality, and in fact, everything we see, everything we perceive is all up in here. This, this is the reality and what goes on in up, up in here, our brains. So, we're calling the brain your receiver, okay? Whatever the ultimate nature of spiritual experience might be, whether it is in fact a perception or an actual spiritual reality, they're not calling it one or the other, or merely an interpretation of sheer neurological function, all that is meaningful in human spirituality happens in the mind. The conclusion to be drawn from all this growing fund of knowledge is that every event that happens to us or any action that we take can be associated with activity in one or more specific regions of the brain. Everything you do has a specific region. Everything that happens to you that you interpret. This includes necessarily all religious and spiritual experiences. Everything you interpret happens up here. The evidence further compels us to believe that if God does indeed exist, the only place, the only place he can manifest his existence would be in the tangled neural pathways and physiologic structures of the brain. Agreed? Now, somebody accosted me this week in the operating room and said, have you ever heard of this? So. I'm entitling this slide, Someone Else is Doing Our Work, because I assume most of us are Seventh-day Adventists. I happen to be a third generation. So I'm well steeped in the lore of our, uh, the beginnings of our church. And what I'm titled this slide is, Somebody Else is Doing Our Work. Any of you heard of the Blue Zones? There's a website, nice fancy website. On here, their press releases, they're going to cities in different states, and cities are signing up to do this kind of program. It's called the Blue Zones. This is named the Blue Zones because it's areas on the map where they're circled in blue, where people live very long, have very little disease, and they've identified five places where this happens, okay? Here are the five blue zones if you want to identify them. Icaria, Greece, Mediterranean. Nicoya, Costa Rica. Okinawa, Japan. Sardinia and Italy. You want to get to the last one? This is an educated audience, I like this. So what are the five thi- or the, what are the nine things these people, they've identified these zones, these people live longer, they have less disease. 
What have they identified as commonalities in all these things? So here are the nine identifying factors, okay? These people get some form of exercise. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to run marathons or pump iron, but they are active. Active around the house, move constantly, all of this associated with health. They have a purpose for getting up in the morning. My purpose for getting up is because when my alarm rings, I know I've got to get up because I've got to get somewhere. Which if you notice people that retire and don't have a purpose for getting up in the morning, what happens to them? Kick back, find ways to shed stress. And notice what they're talking about here. Even a nap. A brief nap can shed some stress, okay? I'm not going to advocate going to happy hour because there's evidence that that is not beneficial, but nevertheless, they've identified some form of stress release in that. And the other one, praying. I have to be honest with you, I don't know how anybody can do a job without asking God's presence. I, I couldn't do mine. Eat less. Stop eating when you're 80% full. These are all the things that they've discovered in these five blue zone areas. Uh-oh. Eat less meat. Now, as an Adventist church, we've been given guidelines on this long, long time ago. Somebody else is doing our work. Beans are a cornerstone of most centenarian diets. Drink in moderation. I love this. Only who? Only the Seventh-day Adventists in California don't have one or two glasses a day. So we're going to continue. Faith, denomination doesn't seem to matter, but attending faith-based services four times a month does. It adds to your longevity and health. Don't you find this astounding? This guy's a reporter. Put families first, committing to partner, keeping aging parents and grandparents nearby adds to your longevity. Stay social, build a social network that supports healthy behaviors. In other words, if you're in a community like that, this makes sense. Have we been given any biblical direction for these things? Well, let's start way back in the beginning, okay? In the garden, what were they told to eat? Genesis 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you it shall be for meat. Now that doesn't mean flesh. That just means what they eat, food. So the seed and the fruit. Would it surprise you if I told you that science is now discovering chemicals in all these things, and we're going to get to that later, that are absolutely essential to good health? Would it surprise you? What do the animals eat? Every beast of the earth and every fowl of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for food or meat. And it was so. What did the animals eat? What did the lions eat? Grass. What happened after the fall? Genesis 3, verse 17. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. 
Cursed is the ground for your sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. So he adds whatever grows in the ground, right? Tubers, roots. We've been over that word cursed. And I think Bob showed you that those are just the natural restrictions that all these mobile genetic elements have done. So what it's telling us here is something happened in the interplay between the growth of fruits and God had to add something else to complete our diet. Now, one of the essential things in life are bacteria. You would not be here today if it weren't for bacteria in your gut. And plants would not exist if there wasn't a symbiotic relationship between the bacteria and the soil that feed the plant its nutrients, and in exchange the plant gives it certain types of sugars. So something's happened in this whole scenario that now requires God to add some other food that he had not originally intended, vegetables, things that grow in the ground. Okay. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. So something's hijacked nature, because thorns and thistles were not the part of the original plan. We are looking extensively, except here's the reason we haven't found. I'm going to predict that you'll find at the end of the day, behind thorns and thistles is a mobile genetic element. The reason they haven't studied this is because there's no money in it. What drives research is whether you can produce some form of profitable enterprise after that. To produce, show that thorns and thistles came from mobile genetic elements, aside from rose genetic manipulation, there's not much money in this. So let's look at some data. This is taken from the Bible, Methuselah 969 years, Abraham 175, David's down to 70. In the 1800s, the lifespan for an average individual is 40 years. We've come back slightly. The Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Okay, that's the, that to, to us, that's the ceiling, that's the maximum. And frankly, nobody's lived that we know about past this in our generation. Look at this graph. I think that says, if you plot the biblical data of ages, according to the years, what something happened at the flood? What happened dietarily at the flood? What did God allow people to eat? Meat. Meat. Is there any scientific evidence that this will slow your life? Okay, that's what we're going to look at today. I just want to tell you, I don't. when somebody says the Bible isn't a science book, it's absolute rot. The first recorded double-blind medical trial is recorded in there. Did you know that? You want to guess where it is? It's in Daniel. Now, I, mean, I say double-blind because the guy who's judging it doesn't know who got what treatment, right? So that's, he doesn't know which party took what. That's a double-blind study. So let's read it. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Prove your servants, I beseech you, ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Okay? Okay. What happened to the other control group? What did they continue to eat? Whatever was on Nebuchadnezzar's table, right? So here's the final thing. At the end of the day, when the trial was over, what did they find? And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. 
Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't think Daniel was a moron before he started this and he suddenly became a genius afterwards. I think he was a very bright boy to begin with. But something affected what he was doing. Okay? And notice this. Notice how long it says he lived. And Daniel continued even to the first year of King Cyrus. He went through almost three generations of Babylonian kings. That's pretty good. How do we age today? Not well. I can't think of anything more frightening when I look at a picture of the future. What I'm going to leave you today with is a solution to this problem and nobody's talking about it. So let's look at this. If this is the future, it's not pretty. It's the most common type of dementia. 60 to 80% of all the cases are Alzheimer's. Is it preventable? Has anybody told you if it's preventable? No. Nobody's told you. You'll be glad you came today. Notice this, the criteria and guidelines for diagnosing this have just been revised recently. It's recommended that Alzheimer's disease can be considered as a disease that begins well before the symptoms. Whoops. So by the time you're getting forgetful, you've been in, you've been caught long time before that. The hallmark abnormalities, which are beta amyloid plaques when you take a pathologic section of the brain and look at it, and twisted strands of protein called tau proteins, okay? Beta amyloid and tau proteins. Remember these words, because when you see them pop up, you're gonna know, oh yeah, that means Alzheimer's disease. They're evidence of nerve damage and death, nerve cell death in the brain, okay? Well. What is it that we can find out about this disease? And please note this. There are detectable levels of biomarkers or signs of this that can be detected before the earliest signs of the disease start. In other words, if you take spinal fluid samples, other things, you can detect signs of the disease long before you've got memory problems. By the time you've started to lose or forget things, you've gone too far. The preclinical or pre-symptomatic stage reflects current thinking that Alzheimer's begins creating changes in the brain, your receiver, as many as what? 20 years before symptoms occur. That's frightening. What are the risk factors? Well, the older you get, that's a risk factor. But notice this, it is not a normal part of aging. So it's abnormal. Well, if you have a family history of it, that's a risk factor, but they don't know whether that's simply environmental, lifestyle, or genetic. We know there's one genetic marker for it. That's apolipoprotein E, the gene if you have that specific mutation. But notice this, if you have it, what does it say? It doesn't guarantee you'll get it. Alzheimer's disease. So what's at play here? If you have cardiovascular disease, that's a risk factor. Physical inactivity, high cholesterol, diabetes, smoking, and obesity. Risk factors for Alzheimer's. Social engagement and diet, whoops. Are you socially interactive? Do you participate in society? What, what are the things we saw about the people that live long? They have a social network, their diet's different, their activity level, they get up, they do things, they're active. We're gonna concentrate on that dietary aspect of that in a minute. And here's to all the former football players. 
you, you bang that organ around enough and guess what happens? You're going to suffer. Now that we're paying for all of our neighbors' bad medical habits, please enjoy this slide. These are the projected number of people above 65 and over that are going to get Alzheimer's disease. The upper limit of the yellow mark is the highest projected. The lower is so the line indicates the middle. In 2000, 4.5 million. In 40 years, what have we done to that figure? Over doubled it, haven't we? What's going on? Why is it going up? You want to see something more shocking? Between 2000 and 2008, the changes that medical science has elicited in the types of death that people have. Please notice, people that have HIV, the deaths have gone down. Heart disease, down. Breast cancer, down 3%. Prostate cancer, I'm reading backwards for you. Stroke, 20% down. What's happened to Alzheimer's disease? Up, 66%. Somehow this has been a massive failure. If we've conquered all these other diseases, what's going on here? To hit closer to home, let's look at the healthcare costs in the state of Ohio. Top line, I want you to notice the, the third column there, the value of unpaid care. If you're taking care of somebody with Alzheimer's and they were to pay you or the caregivers for family members, look at that amount. That's a big number. Is that billions? Yes. Eight billion. The state of Ohio pays 340, paid $345 million to take care of these. Down at the bottom is the totals, $210 billion of unpaid care in the entire United States. Since we're paying for our neighbors' bad health habits now, is this something that should concern us? Total payments in 2012, Medicare, $104.5 billion just to take care of one disease. And it's going to increase. This is, this is not a solvable problem. Is this true? Well, let's look. This article appeared in New Scientist, September 2012. Food for thought. What you eat may be killing your brain. Nice bite out of the chocolate there, isn't it? Inside, the article started off like this. Eat your way to dementia. Is the Western diet poisoning our brains? This is where it started. Suzanne Delamonte had some rats. They were disoriented and confused. What they were doing was navigating their way around a circular water maze. I'm going to show you that in a minute. A common test for rodents. By the way, rodents are excellent swimmers. They quickly forgot where they were and they couldn't figure out how to locate the hidden submerged safety platform that they had no, learn about, learned about before. Instead, they splashed around aimlessly. They were demented. They couldn't learn or remember, says Delamonte, a neuropathologist at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. So there's the maze. What you do is you put a rat in it. Rats are smart. The reason they use a water maze is because rats smell very well. 
but the water dissipates any smell, so it's a perfect test for memory. Put different colors underneath or different signposts around the side, doesn't matter. The rats learn where the safety platform is, so they swim to it, get on it, and they're shaking, they're fine. So the rats all knew this ahead of time. Then she did something experimentally. She injected a medication into the rat's brain that stopped the effects of insulin. Okay? Stopped the effects of insulin. Now, when we have a disease that insulin is no longer working in ourselves, what do we call, what, ourselves, what do we call that? Diabetes. Diabetes. Okay? So what they did was they couldn't figure out what was going on with these rats, so they, they sacrificed them, they sectioned their brains and looked at them. A closer look at a rat's brains uncovered devastating damage just by causing the brain not to use insulin. Areas associated with memory were studded with bright pink plaques. Amyloid protein. Like rocks on a climbing wall, while many neurons full to bursting point with a toxic protein, tau proteins, were collapsing and crumbling. As they disintegrated, they lost their shape, their connections with other neurons, teetering on the brink of death. Such changes, everything she saw histologically, pathologically, were hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. Just by making the brain cells resistant to the effects of insulin. Delamonte had interfered with the way the rat's brains responded to insulin. The hormone is most famous for controlling blood sugar, but it also plays a key role in brain signaling. Whoops, look at that. When Delamonte disrupted its path to the brain's neurons, the result was dementia. I'm not a rat, you say. There's Dr. Delamonte and a morning talk show in Rhode Island. And this is a transcript of that interview. Alzheimer's disease, diabetes of the brain. You heard about this? So the moderator on the show says, I've never heard of this. Is this a new idea? And this, these are Delamonte's responses. In reality, before the 1980s, there was very little overlap between Alzheimer's and diabetes. In fact, up until 1980, deaths from diabetes were declining in the United States. That's probably because the improvements in medical treatment. But between 1980 and presently, now, the deaths from Alzheimer's and diabetes have skyrocketed at an alarming rate. Diabetes story is especially frightening because everybody agrees that today we have much better medical treatments than we did in the 60s. Why should the death rates be so high now? Are people with diabetes more likely to get Alzheimer's? Absolutely. Their risk is doubled at least. Obesity also increases the risk of cognitive impairment, dementia, or mental decline. This doesn't mean that everyone who has diabetes will develop Alzheimer's disease or that people with Alzheimer's have diabetes. The important thing to recognize, there's a considerable overlap between the two. How are these findings reached, says the moderator? Well, we worked on the idea that insulin resistance in the brain was an important cause of disease and injected another drug into the brain to see what would happen. Instead of getting what we were looking for, we found Alzheimer's disease. Very soon after that, I realized that the drug I used was a nitrosamine. A bell went off in my head and suddenly I understood the problem. All the major diseases related to insulin resistance which are now epidemic in the United States could have been caused by low exposures to nitrosamines over a period of years. We'll get to that. How can I reduce my risk? That's, that's where the money is. That's what we want to know now, isn't it? The main message is stop getting exposed. 
There are small steps and large ones. Protect yourself by looking for sodium nitrate, nitrite, nitrite on food labels. Common preservative. Avoid processed foods. Eat organically grown foods. Why is she telling you to eat organically grown foods? What's the difference between mass produced and organically grown? What type of fertilizer do they use? Nitrites, exactly. The only advantage nutritionally is that you do not get exposed to these nitrites with organically grown. Push policies to return farming back to local environments to gain control of how food is produced and eliminate requirements for toxic preservatives. I'm going to ask you a question. Does the FDA have your best interest in heart? <laughs> we won't go there. Educate children. Provide only healthful food choices. Learn to cook and teach cooking in public schools. Pack a healthy lunch the night before so it's easy to grab and go in the morning. Here's her paper, Nitrosamine Exposure Exacerbates High-Fat Diet Mediated to Type 2 Diabetes. Notice everything that it gives you. Non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, fatty liver. That's what the medical name for it is. And neurodegeneration with cognitive impairment. So one of the things that triggers this is these preservatives and fertilizers that are being used. I'm just going to read the bottom summary. All together, these raise concerns about the double insult of chronic low levels of nitrosamine exposure and high fat diet consumption. You put those two together, you got a lethal combination on the brain. Ah, she's just all wet. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Wrong. 2012, the Journal of Clinical Ex Investigation proved that when they autopsied, with, you have to catch it within one hour after death when you autopsied brain cells and ran microarrays on their function, which is a small chip test that they do. They demonstrated in all Alzheimer's patient insulin resistance. And it's associated with insulin growth factor receptor and insulin receptor itself. And all of them had cognitive decline. The evidence is there. She's not wet. They're arguing with this, with this term, and it's merely semantics. They're saying type 3 diabetes or insulin resistance syndrome, we can't call it insulin resistance of, or diabetes of the brain because with diabetes you have high blood sugars. So they're, they're getting into a technical argument here. But if you have type 1 diabetes, you're more likely to have on occasion, low blood sugar, because you've got too much insulin. So the argument is neither here nor there. What the point is, insulin's not working. A more accurate term, they say, is insulin-resistant brain state. So you see, it's, they're just they're arguing about the terms. OK, you say, well, it's genetic. All of this is genetic. You're just lucky. Well, let's look at this because they, they've they been looking very closely at the genetic component. The first author of this paper, Nir Barzilai, has been studying Ashkenazi Jews. And some of them, no matter what they do, live to old age, without diseases, without arthritis. And here's the take home message. It's not the genes that you have, it's how you take care of them. So let's Give me a guess. If you have genes, what part do they play? How much percent do they play in longevity? 80%? Take a guess. Well, here's the answer. So that leaves a large amount for environmental or what you do or how you impact your genes. Genes contribute only 20 to 25% to longevity.
Now we're going to get to the money here. This paper came out recently. Some of you have seen it because we talked about it in one of our health lectures. Leucine signaling in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes. Why has diabetes been going up and death rates from diabetes increasing? That's the mysterious question. Now, do any of these papers have any indication of what's doing this? They're saying in this paper, leucine signaling. Now, leucine is an amino acid. It's known as an essential amino acid, means you have to have it in order. You, your body does not make it. There are nine that your body does not make that are called essential. The secret to all of this is most of those are manufactured by bacteria, and that's the take-home point. If you give the bacteria in your gut, or you have the bacteria that make them, and that's a very interesting point. We'll get to that some other time. All right. In every cell... In every cell is a little nutrient sensor that says build or don't build, which makes sense, right? If you don't have the basic building blocks, you wouldn't embark on building a wall. If you, don't, if you have no bricks, you're not going to build a wall. The cell functions much the same way. It senses how many nutrients are coming in, how many basic building blocks, and says build, nope, not enough. Stay quiet for a while. Okay? Every cell has one of these. And the official name for it is the target of rapamycin complex. That's a fancy term. The reason they know this is because rapamycin, which comes from a bacteria, is an immunosuppressant. We've known this because we've given it to people that have kidney transplants and their transplants grow, continue to grow. All right? So what they decided to look at is wow, we found this drug that stops, allows kidney transplants to grow. Let's figure out what's, what it's doing. What they discovered was it was inhibiting this growth nutrient sensor protein that sits in every cell. So how does that have to, what does that have to do with immunosuppressing or allowing you to accept a transplant? We're going to get to that in a minute, but just know this. It's called mTOR. We're just going to abbreviate that to mTOR. That stands for mammalian target of rapamycin complex. It's this complex protein that senses nutrients and says build or not build. Okay? Simple. You got it all? Signaling through the nutrient-sensitive kinase, mammalian target of rapamycin, is activated by amino acids. So if you're going to build proteins, you've got to have amino acids because that's what makes up the proteins. This thing decides when you're going to build proteins. And it's triggered, which would make perfect sense, by amino acids, right? Since mTOR signaling is positively regulates protein synthesis, ribosome biogenesis, that's just the things that make the proteins, both of which require amino acids, it makes physiologic sense that this mTOR, I'm going to erase the C on that complex and just call it mTOR, is regulated by amino acids. But notice this. Withdrawal of leucine has been shown to be nearly as effective in shutting down mTOR as withdrawal of all amino acids. So one amino acid is exceedingly more powerful than all the others combined. Moreover, the preeminent effect of leucine withdrawal has consistently observed in a variety of cell types. It doesn't matter what cell you take leucine away from it, it has the same effect on this nutrient sensor. Okay? Basic outline. Let's look at a diagram. This is a cell. Don't worry about all the fancy stuff here. I'm just going to show you something here. Please follow the arrow. See this? Here's the mTOR complex, right there in the middle. When you get amino acids or leucine, the AA stands for amino acid transport, it comes in here, it gets picked up by other proteins, and it fires up mTOR, okay? Time to build. We've got the nutrients. Notice also that if you take in glucose and all these other things, they activate mTOR. So it's, glucose is used as energy, amino acids as building blocks for proteins. Great. Give us some glucose, give us some amino acids, let's build. I want you to notice something else here. Off in the red here, these are known to be inhibitors of mTOR. There's resveratrol. You've all heard of that. 
Where's that? Grapes? E.G. C.G. Compound found in green tea. D.I.M. Diendol methane found in cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Curcumin. This is a spice found in turmeric and other plant-based products. Don't get too excited about this caffeine, all right? It will shut down mTOR, but it also damages a DNA repair enzyme, okay? So be careful with that one. Now, all of these things, insulin, glucose, and leucine activate mTOR. Now, that makes perfect sense. You need the cell to function to do what it's supposed to do. It says, I need energy and I need the building blocks and I'll do it. But one amino acid more than any other fires this up. Okay? So this makes sense. I want you to notice there's a very little tricky feedback thing down here. Now, when mTOR is activated right here, it produces something called 6 kinase. All right? This 6 kinase, if you look up here, see where you see that red line? It blocks the insulin receptor. So it's a form of a feedback. When it says, I've got enough energy, don't bring any more in. Don't stop the effects of insulin, okay? Nice safety mechanism. What is one of the things that the dietitians will tell you if you're a diabetic? What should you eat? High protein, right? Why? Keeps your sugar even, supposedly, right? Well, that makes perfect sense. If you're eating higher protein, then that comes down, activates mTOR. mTOR produces M6, M, uh, S6. S6 blocks the insulin receptor. What are you really doing to the cell? Yeah, the insulin, but the glucose isn't going in, right? But your sugar stays fine because the insulin isn't working. So when you eat high protein, are you really keeping your sugar better or are you starving yourself from what it really needs? You see these pathways? Gets better. I'm going to hit this in detail on each one of these specific things here in a minute. But notice this. In this same article, it's talking about leucine, the amino acid, as triggering diabetes. Plant-derived polyphenols, those are just chemicals found in plants, and flavonoids, fruit, other plants, are identified as natural inhibitors of mTOR. Is this new? This is in Genesis. And exert anti-diabetic and anti-obesity effects. The next underlying part, attenuation or lessening of leucine-mediated mTOR signaling by defined, defining upper limits of the daily intake of leucine-rich animal and dairy proteins may offer a chance to prevent what? What did they just say? In other words, if we set safe upper limits of dairy and, di and meat products, we're going to significantly impact diabetes? Is that what that's saying? Looks like it to me. But it gets better, as well as other epidemic diseases of civilization with increased mTOR signaling, especially cancer, neurodegenerative diseases. Are we causing this by eating these proteins that are triggering something we don't clearly understand? This is going to absolutely blow you out of the water. Okay? Most Americans consume protein in excess of their needs. You have got to have your protein. Protein intake average, now look at this, 56 grams per day in young children. Is this a problem in young children? When you're growing and you stimulate your mTOR, is it going to be a problem? Probably not. Because guess what? Your cell, your body's growing. You're doing, you're growing, your muscles are growing, you're developing. Not a problem. But that increased to a high of 91. That's almost double in adults. Now, how much are adults growing? How many cells are you adding to your body? How many neurons, how many muscle cells are you adding once you reach adulthood? 
So why are you feeding it fertilizer? But this is where it gets even more shocking. Look at the last one. And it decreased from 91 to 66 in the elderly. Now, 66 is higher than 56, which is in young children. Old people that aren't growing are getting more protein than young children that are growing. And now we've seen what some of these protein constituents do to the cell growth. Are we overeating protein? Let's look. All right, this study was done in Germany. Same article that's talking about this. The average animal product consumption per capita in Germany. Look at the 50s. Okay, the 50s up here. Let's look at this. Total meat, 26.3 kilograms per year. Okay, what happened in 74? Oh, we're getting much more affluent. We can afford it now, right? So how much does the consumption go up? 55.8. In 2007, 2008, we've gone even higher. When did diabetes start to rocket? Since the 60s, right? Look at eggs. Look at fish. Gone down. Cheese? Well, it's come back. Cheese? I love cheese, everybody says. Every time I give this lecture, you know what everybody says? I love cheese. Let's see what you say after this lecture. 3.9 in the 50s. 3.9 in the 50s. 11.7. Have we gone down? How much has it gone up? It's doubled from the 70s. Pizza. Pizza. So in Germany, in Germany, ah, you say we don't live in Germany. Just wait. Total per capita, total meat consumption per capita, Germany. In the 50s, it was down there in the 20s, mid-20s. See this? 50s, mid-20s, 75 it grew. It seems like we've plateaued up here about 60, right? But from the 50s, it's almost, you can well, easily say it's more than doubled. Here's where the money is. This is the amount of leucine which triggers the growth then in animal derived foods. All right? Now please notice leucine in milligrams per hundred grams. All right? Cheese, 2,950 milligrams of leucine. What are you doing to mTOR? The growth sensor in the cell. What are you doing to it? What are you doing to your insulin resistance when mTOR gets fired up? Look at semi-hard cheese. 2,503. Oh, Gouda, there's that nice one. 32 or 2,356 milligrams per 100 grams of food. Fish, 18. Cottage cheese. 1,290. Think you're losing weight when you eat cottage cheese? Yogurt, 410. Cow's milk, 381. Look at the plant-derived leucine content of plant-derived foods. Corn, 390. Just like, just like milk. Wheat, 270. Now, is, is there any comparison here between the protein or leucine content between this and animal products? It's a huge significant difference, wouldn't you say? When that website says eat less red meat and centenarians have more, eat more beans and they don't have nearly the medical problems that the non-blue zones have, are you seeing a, a cause here? Tomatoes, apples,
So this is their conclusions. The high leucine content of meat and dairy products provided by the typical Western diet significantly differs from low leucine intake of vegetables and fruits or the traditional Asian diet. During the last five decades, there's been a steady increase in leucine intake, exemplified by total annual per capita leucine consumption in the German population. So total amount of animal derived leucine per capita in Germany, in the 50s it was 877. Look at this, it's gone up. Why have diabetic deaths gone up? Why have Alzheimer's disease, why is it increasing? Are we causing this? Just hold your judgment for a little bit. We're going to give you more stuff here. The per capita leucine intake of animals. We've been through this. Just showing you again how it's increased in these. I love this slide. This shows you the average mean daily intake in grams per day of total meat, red meat, and processed meat. Now. What did Delamonte say was one of the worst things you could have? Nitrates. Where do you find those? Processed meats, right? All right, let's look at different countries around here. Here's the UK. Men and women, 108, 72 grams per day of meat. Germany, 154. Look at Greece, 78 and 47. What do they talk about the Mediterranean diet? How wonderful it is. Significantly lower in red meat, right? Don't act too smug because when I show you the United States at the bottom, don't be shocked, okay? Is anybody close to us? 260, 168. There's not a country in the world that consumes that much red meat. And what's red meat high in? Leucine. Now that you're paying for the bad habits of all your neighbors, you should be concerned. Do you see this down here at the bottom? This is the USA. We're off the charts. Let's look at mTOR, that nutrient sensor that sits in every cell. So this is the way I want you to think of it, okay? Pretend this is an airliner taking off. When you, at the end of the runway, getting ready to start your flight, what do you hear the engines do? They rev up, full power, right? When you get to cruising altitude, what do they do to the engines? Throttle back, all right? So I want you to think of mTOR as the same thing. When you're taking off and you're trying to get to cruising altitude, when you're coming down, do you hear them accelerate the engines even more? I can tell when flights from the east, west coast to the east coast, when we've reached, starting to approach Dayton, when we're getting ready into the approach pattern, engines go back even more. I can hear it because we're now coming down. We don't need any more speed. So mTOR is your jet engine. Okay, When you're growing, it's fine. Throttle up. Build that body. Fill out that soma. Do whatever. When you get to middle age or even when you've reached your growth uh, maturity, what should you do then? You need to start throttling back. You don't need any more protein. What did we see in that uh, slide that showed us the intake of protein in senior citizens? Were they higher than people that were growing? Yes. You do not need as much protein when you're older. So what they're saying here is, well, you need to have a rapamycin and other age suppressants when you get older. You need to throttle back. So let's give you a drug. Keep eating that stuff, but we'll give you a drug that throttles back your mTOR. Just making sense to you? Nature, 2013, January. I apologize, this is a little old. mTOR is a key modulator of aging and age-related diseases. And what they're saying is a key leading target for such interventions is the nutrient sensor pathway defined by the mechanistic target of rapamycin mTOR. Goes by two names, mechanistic or mammalian, doesn't matter. 
Inhibitin or inhib inhibition of this pathway extends lifespan in model organisms and confers protection against growing list of age-related pathologies. You want to live long? Don't stimulate it. And don't, it won't give you diseases if you don't stimulate it. This raises the question, then, what, at what age should we consider giving drugs that stop mTOR? Is, is this making sense to you? We're starting to develop drugs to slow down mTOR. Why don't we stop stimulating it in the first place? Notice there's talking about cognitive decline. It can be detected as early as 45 years of age in otherwise healthy people. If mTOR inhibition has even modest positive effect in cognitive function, it could improve the quality of life in millions of middle-aged and older adults, decreasing the incidence of disease. <clears throat> Oops. mTOR regulates tau phosphorylation and degradation. Tau protein, tangles, Alzheimer's. This is a paper showing you that it directly affects the formation of these proteins, okay? Implications for Alzheimer's disease. In summary, we show that increasing mTOR signaling facilitates tau pathology, or the misshaping form of these proteins in them, while reducing mTOR ameliorates tau pathology, makes it better. Don't want Alzheimer's? Don't stimulate mTOR. It's that simple. Let's go to another area. The impact of cow's milk mediated mTOR signaling in the initiation and progression of prostate cancer. Ladies don't have to worry about this. I just want to read the underlying portion here because they make a very strong statement. Epidemiologic evidence points to increased dairy protein consumption as a major dietary risk factor for the development of prostate cancer. But I love my ice cream. Fine, what do you want? mTOR is a master regulator of protein synthesis, lipid synthesis, and autophagy pathways. I'm gonna come back to that in a second because that's important. That couple nutrient sensing to cell growth. This review provides evidence that prostate cancer initiation and progression are promoted by cow's milk, not by human milk stimulation of mTOR signaling. Did you hear what they just said? That's, in order for you to make a statement like that, you have got to have the data to back it up. Otherwise, the American Dairy Association attorneys are knocking at your door. I've never found talking to the, about these concepts to anybody affects anybody's change. But when you get a chance today, I want you to Google the word somatic cell count. If we have time at the end of the lecture, I'm going to show you what it is. Somatic cell count. Okay? That's all I'm going to say. It is the most effective way to get people to stop drinking milk. Besides, in this country where we have almond milk or rice milk, soy milk, why do you need something that comes from a cow? Can we slow aging? The prospective treatment of age-related diseases by slowing down aging. Our atherosclerosis, hypertension, obesity, diabetic complications, cancer, benign prostatic hyperplasia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, age-related macular degeneration, osteoarthritis, no, 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 come on, you can't be serious. Osteoporosis, seborrheic keratosis are strongly associated with aging. Suppression of aging itself should delay and treat all age-related diseases, thus increasing health lifespan and maximum longevity. Look at the yellow. Recent evidence indicates the target of rapamycin signaling pathway is involved in cellular senescence and organismal aging. So let's try rapamycin, because if that's what inhibits it, right? This is how it works on a 
schematic level. If you've got a fat cell and you give it fertilizer, such as mTOR, tell it to build, when you're young, it just grows bigger. When you've already reached adulthood, now it becomes huge and starts getting, spreading out the insulin receptors, don't become as receptive. You've got a huge hypertrophied fat cell, okay? It be, sets off the inflammatory components. If you've got a liver cell and you stimulate it, pretty soon it starts to produce fat, you've got fatty liver. If you're a platelet and your job description is to form clots and you stimulate a platelet, what's gonna, what are you gonna do? You're gonna get hypercoagulable, you're gonna form clots anywhere, right? Is this starting to sound familiar with you? If you have an endothelial cell, that's the cell lining the blood vessels, and you stimulate it, what's it going to do? It's going to collect cholesterol. It's going to start breaking down. Now you've got ulcerated plaque. If you're a smooth muscle cell in the blood vessel right over here, and you get stimulated, you're going to form more tight muscle connections. And now when the blood tries to pump through there, because you're, you've, you're beefed up, what's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to be harder you've got high blood pressure. Are you seeing this? If you're a macrophage and your job is to go around and pick up any de debris or any cellular function that's out of order, what do you do? You do it even better. You start cleaning up even minor things, right? Now you've got an inflammatory condition. Is, is this making sense? What are all the problems as we get older? With TOR, more is less. If you want to talk about aging and how to age well, you've got to stop stimulating this pathway. It's already reached cruising altitude, people. We don't need to throttle it forward anymore. Increasing lifespan by suppressing aging in our time, and guess what they're talking about? Same thing again. Aging turns out to be driven by the nutrient sensing pathways such as mTOR. You want to grow old well? Don't stimulate the aging pathway. Now, everybody wants to earn money. What are we going to start looking for? Rapamycin inhibits a target inhibits the mechanistic target of rapamycin and it has the strongest experimental support to date as a potential anti-aging therapeutic in mammals. What does it also do? If you stop mTOR, you're, it suppresses your immune system and it allows a kidney transplant to take place. Is immune suppression a good thing? Probably not. Probably not. So the, rapamycin has side effects. You want everything to keep functioning normally and evenly. You want your immune system to still work, but you don't want it hyper-stimulated, okay? So the idea of a drug that's gonna suppress this will leave you with some risks. So now, guess what they're doing? Well, let's find things that are like rapamycin that don't have the bad side effects. I'm sorry, did I miss something on that a couple slides back? Didn't we show you things in nature that inhibit rapamycin? Do you think that our creator put those there to trick us? Why are we looking for a drug? All of those things were found in plants. Rapamycin extends life and health span because it slows aging. If you want to age properly, give it the natural occurring mTOR inhibitors. You don't want a drug that specifically knocks out mTOR because that, you'll pay a price for that. There's some trickle down effects of that. It, immune suppression is one. Pun intended. Poor Uncle Louie cut down in his prime. Recently, there's been a lot of talk about calorie restriction, okay, as prolonging life. If you take earthworms, if you take any animal and cut down its calories by one-third, it prolongs life, okay? What they're discovering is, at the end of the day, 
what comes into play. You're simply deaccelerating mTOR, right? What was one of those longevity things that they talked about? When you eat, stop when you're what? 80% 80. 80 full. It gets even better. Somebody looked at why on these animals, if we stop mTOR, I mean, if we give them dietary restriction, do they live longer? And what they discovered was, I'll just read it here. Dietary restriction or reduced food intake without malnutrition is associated with extended longevity, improved metabolic fitness, and increased stress resistance in a wide range of organisms. However, this is, what, this is the importance of this paper. Recent data indicate dietary amino acid restriction as a key mediator in di in di <laughs> I love this, in dietary restriction. When they looked at the chow, they discovered it was the amino acid that was causing the problem or the benefit because they reduced the leucine in the chow that they fed to the animals. It's not total calories, it's the leucine that had the effect. So dietary restriction, although it sounds onerous, isn't, as, isn't, the, isn't the answer. It's restricting the leucine that gives you the benefits of the dietary restriction because the chow they were given, the animals they were watching, was less leucine, and that was the difference. Dietary mTOR inhibitors. Let's get to the money. I've showed you these. Resveratrols in grapes, walnuts, EGCG, green tea, cruciferous vegetables, spices like turmeric. Nutrition in aging and disease, update on biological sciences. What do they say? Consumption of foods, I'm reading the yellow, consumption of foods and nutrients high in polyphenols, those, those chemicals, I'll show it to you in a minute. In addition to prudent types of diets, high vegetables, fruits, whole grains, fish, have been shown to prevent and even reverse the occurrence of neurochemical and behavioral changes occurring with age. Conversely, consuming a typical Western diet associated with increased risk of cognitive decline and dementia. What are flavonoids and all these things that you find in here? That's what they look like. They're found in the color. They're found inside the fruit and there's a variety of species. The problem with making a pill is that you have to chemically alter it to get it to form into one entire species. And the magnificent thing about the creator is he gave us a whole range of species and if we keep eating that it affects things we haven't even discovered yet. A very thought-provoking idea. Clever boys, aren't they? I love the way they come up with these. The potential role of plant polyphenols in the treatment of age-related cognitive disorders. Several epidemiologic studies have implied the an association between fruits, vegetables, and dementia. Good, bad, indifferent? Closer adherence to a Mediterranean diet was correlated with a lower risk. More fruits, more vegetables, less problems and it even repairs some of the damage that's been done. We're slow. We are a stubborn and a stiff-necked people. We have had this information for a long time. Canada sees the light. I want to read you an editorial that occurred last September in the Canadian Family Physician Journal. Okay? Family physicians and their patients know our Canadian healthcare system is struggling. <laughs> Ours is going to, too. Expensive medicines, interventions are being devised and used to treat and ameliorate these problems in a reactive way rather than proactive. Why aren't we doing something to stop it, is what he's asking. All this does is add to the expense and the wait time spiral. There's an easier, less expensive route to better health. Epidemiologic research has demonstrated solid evidence linking the prototypical, look at who they're blaming for it, North American, us, high in sugar, animal fat, animal protein, have linked it to obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, high cholesterol, hypertension, 
gallstones, Alzheimer's disease, and the development of some cancers. An opposite association occurs with vegetarian or vegan diets. I have a question. <laughs> One of the purposes of us starting hospitals and things is to spread the good news of Christ by affecting people's health. Why is this coming from Canada? Why is this coming from Canada? This strongly suggests acceptance and promotion of plant-based nutrition can substantially reduce many of our current health care concerns and costs. Canada, putting it simple, plant-based diet is healthier. This, I don't even know if this guy read Genesis. What is he telling us? Something that we as Adventists have known for many, many years. Rather than continuing to expand the early detection and early intervention model of healthcare, we now use a switch in emphasis to prevent modus operandi. Actually, promotion of healthcare protecting diet is now justifiable. Okay, it's gotten too expensive. Now we have to say, you need to change. Shifting dietary emphasis from animal to plant-based nutrition combined with a reduction in refined sugar intake has the potential to exact wide-reaching public health benefits. Less obesity, less heart disease, less cancer, less diabetes, less Alzheimer's. Food for thought. This is Canada and their basic frontline family practice physicians calling for a change in an editorial in their journal. This astound you? Not news. I promised you I'd show you what somatic cell count was. Let's go this. Let's do this first. Look at these promises in Exodus. Uh, and tell me if you think this is just God talking to them. Okay? Exodus 15, 26, and said, If you will diligently listen to the voice of your Lord, your God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep his statutes, I will put none of these diseases on you that I brought on the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that, what? Every, if we had been doing all along everything that's been written there, don't tell me this isn't a science book. Science is just catching up with it. Exodus 23, 25, and 6, 26. You shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take away, I will take sickness away from the middle of you. There shall nothing cast their young, nor be barren in your land. The number of your days I will fulfill. You're not even going to have abortions. Spontaneous abortions. Isn't that how you understand it? Cast their young. Somatic cell count. This is a from the dairyman's journals. Delegates at the biannual conference of interstate milk shipments yesterday narrowly defeated, good for them, a proposed reduction of the somatic cell count legal limit. Okay, they wanted to put it down from the current 750,000 cells per cc. They currently wanted, they wanted to lower it to 400,000 cells per cc. Do you know how much a cc is? You, you're all acquainted with a cc, right? It's just a little bit of a round thing. That's grade A milk. 750,000, what types of cells are we talking about? Not bacteria. Current legal limit, 750 has been in place since 93. Europe has 400,000 and they import some of our, they, they're, they're saying you, you got too many high, you want to bring it down. Many in the industry have sought that somatic cell count in the US should be reduced to 400,000 to bring it in line with those in other countries because we export it. But we've successfully defeated it. Somatic cell count, look it up for yourself. It's the most effective way I've ever known to get anybody to stop this stuff. Somatic cell count is the number of white blood cells per cc 
mainly neutrophils. Now, white blood cells, when you have a collection of white, dead white blood cells, what are we, in that medical profession, what do we call it? Pus. Pus. You're allowed to drink 750,000 per cc in grade A milk. Don't believe me, look it up. Is that why milk's white? Now, if I came up here, and I'm not trying to be facetious, if I came up here with a cup of something that came from the operating room and said, how much would I have to pay you to drink it? Uh, I couldn't get a number. But what are we doing? We're paying somebody to drink it from a cow. Are you joking? This makes no sense to me. Not to mention mTOR. Please look this up for yourself. It's criminal. If you can have rice or almond or soy, why would you need this? And let's have some dried one. Jeez, ah, there's a good idea. We'll get some concent we'll concentrate the leucine and we'll get some dried pus. That sounds great. I'm not trying to be demeaning here, but this makes no sense to me. This stuff is not good for us. Have we heard this before? Sadly, yes. Somebody made a statement years ago. Cheese is unfit for human consumption, and we've laughed to scorn. What is it showing? When you see that picture, what do you think of now? Is that an attractive picture? I don't think so. Let's bow our heads. Father, as we come and talk about some of the magnificent things you've done, how you've warned us about all these things, your promises that you've made. We ask that you'll forgive our stubbornness. Please stay with us, bring us into the kingdom. And if we start to get out from under, we ask that you'll keep us in underneath. In Jesus' name, amen.